Some people are tired of records, more new records, so I'm not going to do it this time. So here's a tour of the Audio Research Factory. We are at Audio Research outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Audio Research survives, and as you can see outside, they've uh, laid new cement in front, buried all the bodies, and the business continues. Well, uh, this is a facility they moved into a couple of years ago. It could be five years by now, and uh, things are still being organized. And this is a room that has, uh, it's like their conference room, and it has a bunch of awards. I mean, this is a company that goes back to 1970, and you can see some of the awards here from the various magazines and some of the equipment. Uh, we use the term storied to describe a company like this, and um, we're all, e even the competition, must be happy that, that uh, they've survived uh, a serious financial issue. And uh, you can see some of the products that are in here. Various vintages are here. But there's a lot more to see here. So, so look at this. This is one of the original. And here's Mr. Dave Gordon, another one of the survivors. Michael, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Dave. Thank I've you. I've seen you for many years. Many, many years. Many, many years. Yes. That's right. All right, so now we are in the hallway just outside, and there's more awards. We moved into this facility five years ago, and uh, it's a little smaller than the other one we had before, so we're, um, we're kind of compressed, and we keep moving things around, and uh, so we just got another 10,000 square feet oh. next door, oh. and so we're going to kind of walk through what we have now into the new space, it'll get reorganized, and then we'll move around through there into the, uh, the regular big space. All right. Now here, I have to stop here because right. this is so great, so this is... This is Bill Johnson's store, Electronic Industries, and that was originally the name of the company, right? Right, yeah. Bill uh, opened up Electronic Industries in 52, uh, and when he got out of the Army, and he was uh, doing TV repair, selling hi-fi, uh, repairing hi-fi, and building custom products. So he was building his own custom amplifiers and preamps for hardcore files. Now this picture, which is obviously a Christmas time picture, right. still, it looks like it's from a train set. You know? <laughs> yes, it, I mean, it really does look good. And this also looks like a train set, but this is real. Right. And uh, yeah, he carried all the good stuff at the times. H.H. H. Scott and uh, Macintosh. And, uh, you know, that was... You know, it's funny because I visited the H.H. H. Scott factory in Powder Hill Road, I think it was called, in, okay. in Maynard, Mass, wherever it was. Sure. And this is in 1970, I think I was there. Okay. Only because uh, I made friends with a guy who was dating Scott's daughter. It was, <laughs> and that's how I got to tour the factory. Right. It was the craziest thing. I, I wasn't in the hi-fi. I was into hi-fi, but I wasn't in the business. All right, so here's the 20th anniversary um, plaque. Yeah, it seemed like a long time back. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> a long ago time now. ago. I'm sorry, but all right. Here's a this is hand calligraphy from the Absolute Sound from. Yeah, we won the uh, the pre amplifier of the decade and the amplifier of the decade from uh, from TAS for the their first ten years. Yeah. So Harry started at what in '73. Yeah. Now we're into more contemporary. Um, awards right well we just these actually had hooks so we put them up on the wall we need to reorganize all the awards and put them in one place yeah it's, it's okay for now it's fine we can for just now it's walk fine. through here and show now here's my previous endeavor and this is a review written by Robert J. Reyna who was a friend of mine who's passed away too many people have passed away I miss Bob he's gone and he was so enthusiastic and oh yeah and he was said he was a really good pianist right yep he was good he was in a band and uh, I have some of their records and some more awards and I'm sure there are other awards in the closet that you'll have to take out when you're finally there are a lot of the things story. in the closet <laughs> around <sure>. here <laughs> <laughs> that's all another story okay uh, okay so now we're 
but so tell me where we're going now. Okay, so. we're gonna walk down past uh, our service area. So we were in the plant, we moved it out here for more space. We normally like to have two technicians and uh, so right now we have Carl and Carl does a great job for Hi, us. Hi Carl. Hey. Not too many shocks lately? No, I <laughs> no. try not to do that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well you have a nice space. Yeah. Nice open. It's not like in a cubicle someplace. Yeah, you have outside. You can no, you see know. the comings and goings, and yeah, yeah that's good. Nice, yeah. And you, you're facing this way, so you don't get distracted. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So what's being repaired here? Just out of curiosity. This is a Ref Six single end. What uh, happened? Uh, this one had a two bark, and usually it'll take out a couple of resistors, couple of resistors here yeah. in the in the voltage regulator circuit, and this case it had that uh, kind of uncommon problem of it taking out a okay a, right a board besides and this will go back to a happy customer soon yeah. and yes. yeah, it is. yeah good yeah. okay thank you and this is also uh, repair all, all service so we we try to repair products going back to the uh, I mean our first products from uh, from 1970 so it just depends some of these are uh, uh, our dealer demos, some of these are customer units. We try to schedule everything in so uh, we don't have to sit with a lot of products. We're, until we get a second tech back in house, uh, we're just a few months behind right now. Yeah. But for example, like this is an old, uh, was an OSP6, so, mm -hmm. and that's typical. So, is it hard finding techs these days? People yes, work, it's yeah. hard finding good people who know how to work with high voltages. Yeah, because everything's throwaway right. now in, in the main exactly. stream. And this is a, this is your parts. This uh, is these part are your, all legacy parts, right? Yeah. These are parts for uh, for old products, and they're typically they're not made anymore. A lot of times we have to modify them so they'll work in the units. But uh, you know, the good thing is that you know Bill Johnson always said the only way to maintain value is to be able to service them. Everything. True. Was, that was is true. It was expensive in '70, and it's, ex it's expensive now. And so. and you know, too many of these sniping consumers don't understand that part of the cost of doing business, a part of what you're paying for, is that that service is going to be around for as long as you own the product, and then it also will be around when you sell the product right. to replace it with something newer. That the person right. who buys it can be assured that they're right. going to get service on their right. on their product. Well, that's the thing. That everything gets passed down. Somebody wants to upgrade, so they sell it, and somebody else uses it. Yep. Okay. Is this is this just a stand or is this a subwoofer? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just our, our just, just a stand. stand. Okay, so you have you have the con study and contrast here a right. a Clipshorn and, and a, a Sabrina, Sabrina X, X yeah, which is yes. a great speaker. Both both interesting yes. speakers. What I'd also we'll stop in here to have you take a look at is we actually build our own ghost meters in house, so. Uh, Barry Hans has been with us for, for quite a while, and uh, so he hand assembles them. We get the uh, the meter movements from a, uh, a U.S. company. Really? We have the acrylic. Yes, uh, the acrylic is we get locally, and we uh, laser etch it ourselves. And uh, it's and there's it's an old an old task down right. there, boy. That's an old one. Yes. And you can see, so we have meters all set up now for reference 80, reference 160 M's, the monos of the stereo. Hmm. Done in-house. That's Done in-house. Cool. So this way we don't have a long lead time. We know exactly what we're going to need. Yep. And okay. here we are in engineering. And... Uh, Chris is at, is working on a uh, Santa is working on a um, the new three three twenty M, which hopefully we'll have out later or at the end of this year. Should so we not show the innards? Is this no? Don't secret? show the yeah. Don't show the inside yet. Okay. We're not it's, a work, it's a work, it's a in, work progress. in progress. We all are works in progress. <laughs> That's right. Hopefully. And what's over? Can we show this? What what is this? this is another? Well, that was actually another prototype of. About shouldn't, sh shouldn't show shouldn't that. Shouldn't show that. Well, that okay. I'm not yeah, showing that, that yet. And it's all of what's down. If I show from way, way back, just mm -hmm. so people can see that things are things right. are. I'll do a quick shot. Sure. Things are progressing here into the future, like a Steve Miller song. Okay, and then uh, we'll keep moving.
Right. We got some extra space uh, early this year. Philips Electronics was here, and um, we carved out 10,000 square feet. Our old facility was over 40,000 square feet. Right. Where you, where you did a tour a long time ago. Yes. And uh, this space we got is about 21, so this will make it about 32,000 right, so square feet. So what we want to do is we want to be able to set up a true archive here. We will probably move engineering over here. We'll move service down to engineering's area. And here we have Calvin Dahl and Greg Christensen. And uh, Hi, they're entering Hello. parts orders and talking to customers. So they stay pretty busy. OK. Always good to keep busy. And then here's uh, one of Alan Perkins's original turntables, which I have to show because I, there are some younger people that are going to see this. See this turntable? This is the original RPM, I believe. Right. So, so Alan designed this in the 90s, I yes. believe. Yeah. And everybody copied this. You can, you can look at turntables from, I'm not going to name the manufacturers, <laughs> but they all copied Alan's design. He was first with this look of this curve and the whole right. thing, so. Yeah, that's a great table. That's Alan's an old friend, because he yeah. was originally from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. That's right, yep. And he actually moved back. I know, so, I know. And we're lucky because we have Tree Mai from uh, Triplaner is local. Right. So we've used his arms for a long time. Yeah, they're nice arms. Yes. And then this is this is where you have the archives temporarily residing while you right. get things organized. So we're just going we'll do a quick reconnoiter here. We're not gonna dwell too much on the past. But I'll tell you a funny story. You know, yeah. we all were friends with Art Dudley. Sure. And um, and I was with Art at a, at a CES, and there was you had a table in a room, and there was. Um, the new, all the new, beautiful-looking electronics, right. sure. and then on top of that was a row of the older, older square stuff. Sure. And uh, Art said, "I'm glad they went back to that that old look. I like that, I like that better." That, <laughs> that was Art. That was Art. That was Art, that was art all the way. Yeah. And if you look at those Ref 600s, those, uh, you know, I don't think people appreciate how large those things were. Yeah. You know, or are. Or and, uh, today so there are a lot more big things like this. A lot more you big guys things. were kind of first with this kind of yes. big. Yes, and uh, you know, four fans per amplifier, and uh, they weighed 170 pounds each, and they, um, uh, you know, even with the fan speed down low, they uh, it could sound like you were at the uh, the airport. And but try to keep to, you, all those fans. Oh, trying yeah. to keep all those tubes cool. Yep. This is an X, SP ten. That That's actually an SP fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, that was our last two chassis preamp until the anniversary yeah. came out when we were forty years old. And that, that's the kind of piece that you could put back into production that people right. would really dig. Yes. Yep. A little bit of everything here. So uh, and you can see some gold products in the back, old SP3s. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just walk sure. over this. As long as I'm here, I might as well show you some of this right. stuff. This is all her heritage of this company. Right. Dual 51. That was, uh, in fact, I think that was Leonard Gustafson's that he gave us when he retired. Hmm. And uh, Bill used to call the original amps dual for dual channel. And then uh, dual turntables. Uh, really? Sued us, sued Bill, and he uh, went to D50, D51, things like that after. Wow. Picky, picky, picky. Picky, 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 yeah. I didn't think anyone would Ray confuse Bose the like. two. Ray Bose like, in terms of lawsuits. SP11. I never saw one in, in gold like that. Bill created that for uh, the Asian market. I was going to say, yeah. Yes. They, they and, love, they're uh, like gold well, well, we actually did a whole series of SP11s uh, in gold, a series of 50 for, uh, just for Taiwan. Hmm. And it came with a little plaque. They loved it. And then Bill up modified uh, old Dynaco amps. I was going to say, this, this looks like. Right. That was a Stereo 70. Yeah, Stereo 70. That was a great amp. Yes. It was a great it amp. It was easy to modify, had great transformers. 
couldn't sell it very inexpensively today if you made it properly. And this looks like an FM3 modification. Well, actually, that was, yeah, it was, Bill wanted a whole rack of Audi research, so he created his own front panel for an FM3 oh. <laughs> <laughs> with the magic eye. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think he, he built, like, three of those, so this is pretty rare. Yeah. Uh. And this is the original name of the company, Electronic, electronic Industries. Electronic Industries, yeah. right. Yeah, he sold uh, Electronic Industries to a larger company in the, in the 60s and what's called that? Peplo. Oh. And uh, they bought Janssen, and they bought RTR, and oh. Audi Research, and a few other companies. Now, what is, what's, this is a... a mixing console. Mixing, yeah. Bill did mixing consoles, because Minneapolis was a big recording venue. Yes. And a recording area. So he built them for uh, the studios. Oh. And so in this area, we are looking at? We're looking at old test equipment. And uh, we actually want to build a, may want to build a, the archive back here and maybe build another sound room back here. So we only got the space a few months ago. Right. And we were bursting at the seams in the, uh, in the original space. So it's a matter of things just got flushed out here yep. and not very attractive, but it's okay. it's workable. And things are in flux, that's right. That's so well, we have extra room so things get can get moved back here before they uh, they get moved where we want them to be. It's been a work in progress for us. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of the Absolute Sound. We have a new product, it's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks. And now back to the show. Yeah, some prototypes we're working on. We'll, we'll pass by quickly through the prototypes. Okay. We don't sure. want to show too much. Right. Parts. New parts. And back here is... Back labor. here oh. is... Well, we built this out as our IT room and uh, our photo studio. So, so this is, you use the lathe for prototyping. The a lot of prototyping. Usually, it's actually more for uh, tooling for production, and or some uh, knobs and things like that. Things that I can actually turn on it. Um, sure. I would uh, uh, bushings for the uh, to support the encoders and things like that. Where the way we use them, they can't be um, bracketed normally to a chassis. Um, right. So. We have a little bit of a sheet metal shop in here in terms of doing some very small stuff, a box and pan, a good um, drill press. So we end up doing uh, some, the chassis we'll do, uh, we can't build a complete chassis, but I'll cut up a chassis and refit it to, to use for the next, so like the 320, I build my own chassis from existing and chassis. So chassis, you basically have an outsource, you outsource uh, the chassis from a, a local? Uh, local sheet metal shops. Yeah. That's uh, good. Keep it local. Turret, uh, it's um, turret pr press punch, and, um, and then they break as well for us. Then they would send it out, powder coated, and send it back. Some of the products we are actually starting to bring in where they're not powder coated, they're just raw, and we would choose to send them whether they're powder coated, we cerakote it pot potentially, and or anodize some of the parts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we built our own uh, paint booth for the cerakote on the. I-50 integrated amplifier. We decided we wanted to do different colors, and uh, you, anodizing different colors is just inconsistent. That's one of the problems. So we have a couple of ovens where we cure the uh, the Cerakote. Do you want to talk about Cerakote? Sure. The Cerakote is an epoxy-based finish. Okay. It's very thin, so what you end up getting is um, you don't have to mask the holes for screws like you would powder coating or paint. Right. It, 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 doesn't inter it doesn't create an interference fit. It also is, is a little bit more forgiving in terms of it's, the, the finish can be redone. Basically, we would uh, sandblast it over again, 
If which, there's a problem. If there's right. a problem, yeah. and then redo it. Where powder coat, it's almost throwaway, especially on some of the, oh. the more complicated it's parts. It's very attractive. I like the look of it. It's, it's, it's muted, but it's, it almost looks plasticky in a, in a positive right. way. Yes. The, it's, I think it really took off in the, the um, gun and rifle businesses yeah. because it is very durable once it's allowed to fully cure. Yep. Uh, and, and it's, it's also a bead, bead blasting machine? Uh, abrasive blasting, sand blasting basically. Um, we started out with a small version and then we uh, found that the, an, a good industrial one has given us better yield and just more uh, throughput. And this is where things cure? This is actually where they would be coated. Uh, the lights are off so you can hear because the, f the, the fans come on automatically with the lights on, but you would hang them in here, shoot them, um, and then allow them to flash off, shoot them again, and then bake them. And those are your nice new remotes. Right. Yeah. Big improvement over the old remotes. Big, Big improvement, yeah. right. Because that's kind of like where the rubber meets the road. That's where the consumer right. is touching you. Exactly. And he, and, he wants uh, to touch something nice. Yeah. When our old vendor stopped making the metal remotes, we went to a plastic remote temporarily, and uh, when the new metal remote was done, we were able to get the milled metal remotes locally, paint them here, and uh, laser them here. And we actually sent out uh, free remotes to all the owners of the plastic remotes. So That's good. Yeah. Which was in the hundreds. Which was wow. a lot of remotes. Well, that, but that builds customer loyalty and yes. support and a feeling of... Yeah, that's good. Well, we didn't want them holding a plastic remote. No, I, I get it. And so this is stock? This is uh, shipping, stock that's going out. Uh, this is like wherever, this is going to France, uh, staging orders here. And uh, we have some boxed inventory that's ready to go also. Okay. And then here we're waiting. Actually, this is a local pickup. We have a gentleman who uh, bought this from Bill in... 1969 wow. from Electronic Industries before it was turned into Audi Research. This is an SP1, and wow. it's a, uh, uh, his first really great pre. No, I'm saying that Livio uh, Kukuza did some of our transitional designs, and he was inspired by, by the layout for uh, some of the new products. And this is a one-of-a-kind. I haven't seen another one that has this champagne finish, wow. which was typically late 60s. Yeah. Off to the left, we have our uh, packing department. This Andrew is uh, puts the, actually puts the meters on the ref one, on the ref amps now, and uh, installs them. And uh, this will be paneling and and then finally pack out. Right. So he does a lot, the last quality control through here to make sure everything's cosmetically correct. Right. We try to build new products now. Uh, without color. So we have the inner chassis and uh, then we, we panel two colors. So this could be, this will have a black top if somebody wants black, black front panel and, and handles. So uh, Andrew will go by the, uh, the work order. So you'll see the, obviously a set of 160, sorry, VT80s there right. that are in silver compared to the 160Ms that are in black. Right. right, okay. These are more products that are packed are and more getting ready products, to go. products, right, that are ready to go. And uh, so these are sold and just waiting to get packed up and shipped. So here we inventory like the I-50s in all the different colors. Right. Silver and black are the big sellers. Yeah, that's the, but the red isn't. It, no, you'd think the red and the blue would be pretty popular. Yeah, I love and that and the gold also. Yeah, I love and, that. Uh, but the nice thing about this is when we, because we do the colors in house, there's no long delay. Here's a, uh, actually a two chassis reference 10. And uh, just waiting to go back, go to a, uh, a new dealer. Yeah. Here we have our QA station. and. Uh, we bench test everything that's been built. It goes in for burn-in for 24 or 48 hours. Then it gets bench tested the second time. So these are just waiting for testing and installation. Okay. We've been 
Here's your sound. Here's our sound room. This is um, everything after it gets bench tested the second time actually gets listened to in a reference system. So this is Warren's domain. Right. And uh, so it's, this is about as clean as it gets for Warren. So, uh, it's a lot cleaner than my but room. It, it, yeah, but it, it serves a great purpose. And uh, sure. the walls are all double sheet rocked, screwed and glued. So they're, they're very solid. So we don't have a problem with, uh, with sonic breakthrough from the plant. Okay. Okay. It's always nice to see the sound room of a company because if there's no sound room, it's very suspicious. <laughs> You're right. Well, I worked at one company once where the owner would just take everything back home in his uh, station wagon to listen to. Okay, well, that's that's that, okay that, too. That works too. It's better than saying, "Well, we don't have to listen because right. we measure and it's exactly it's uh, that's what we need to know." No. Uh, no. Well, the thing is, we found that we can't measure everything we can hear. That's right. And that's why Warren or Evan uh, or even Chris Osana sometimes will listen to products before they get shipped out because uh, we'll find something that's wrong and it goes back to QA to see, to find out what's wrong. Yes, I remember Warren told me a story the last time about how somehow they had changed the transformer yeah. uh, manufacturer yeah. and the spec was the same. Right. And a bunch of them were installed, and then right. we're sort of listening, going, uh-oh, something's uh -oh. wrong, and yeah. it was that, even though the numbers right. were the same. That was, yeah, I remember that. That was a, uh, uh, actually was using an Asian manufacturer, and we ended up going back to our U.S. vendor, and uh, fortunately in the Midwest, and they, they made a lot of art for us for us, and, uh, and we were, it was back. It mm. drove engineering crazy, because they couldn't measure the difference. <laughs> right. Oh, this, this is the tube? This, yeah, this is a there are two room. And the burn-in tubes and... Right. Well, yeah, we here we uh, we measure the tubes. Uh, after we, we burn all the tubes in for two days, and then we measure them hot. So we put them in here fresh off the, uh, the burn-in fixture, and then we will get our uh, transconductance. Now, this is calibration to 6123. Was it done yet, or did you miss your, did you miss your deadline? <laughs> we may have missed the deadline. Uh -oh. I, need to tell Chris. I need to tell Chris. I'm telling. You're right. So you can see here we, um, uh, we have 6550s and KT150s and KT120s. And a lot of tubes. A lot of tubes. So what we do is with someone, we uh, when a tube comes in and we, we measure it, like this is a uh, 6550, we put the numbers on the bottom of the tube yep. so we can get the exact same numbers. So if a tube goes out, we can replace it with the same numbers and we can make sure the set matches perfectly. I am familiar with that from re reviews. Make sure you put the right tube in the right, right socket. In the right socket, that's right. So we burn in the small tubes, and here we burn in all the output tubes. Well, these are just, these are just burning jigs. Yeah, just burning fixtures. We sent a certain, uh, we created these, we built these a long, long time ago, and they uh, uh, have a certain output, certain frequencies, and we found that if you measure a tube when it's, it's brand new, before burning, it'll measure one way. After, yeah. after two days, it'll measure very differently. And then eventually it settles in and stays, right. hopefully, for right. a while. Oh, it'll, it'll be very stable after that. Yeah. So now we're in production? Yes, we're at the end of production. And uh, so here we're, we're building some boards. And in this case, in fact, these are, this is for CD players. We, uh, Warren, who's our ears, is also our mechanical uh, engineer, or assists in uh, actually damping. And you can see that he, uh, we use a few different materials. So we damped out the caps, yep. damped out some of the uh, heat sinks for the FETs. And the big gold caps here, or in fact, a Really, it depends on the part, but some of them 
we, uh, we actually mount the pieces off the board because we found they sound better. Mm -hmm. so in some cases, we'll use two smaller resistors. They'll sound better than one larger one. So this is the this power is an, supply. This is an engine hoist we use to build REF 750s. And uh, the finished product is going to be so heavy, the only way to solder everything is to be able to rotate it around on the engine hoist. Mm. That'll make some customer very happy when they get this in and installed. And well, when the dealer installs it, he yeah. can throw his back out. <laughs> well, this is all parts. Uh, parts and uh, for current products. It looks like these are all going to China. Okay. Our production works in early day. What time did they start last? They start at 6.30. And what time did they finish? They finish it. 2.30. Well, I like to be here when I'm not bothering anybody yes. that's, that's working. Right. They, you, you wouldn't bother them. They usually don't um, pay nothing. Still slows them down, quite frankly. That's good. Um, walk around here. See that we have an I-50 build area. And so we do everything to try to keep people in good shape so all the drawers or all the shelves are movable. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. With the I-50 we have some surface mount parts on there which we have installed by a local vendor and, uh -huh. uh, and then we put all the large parts uh, we install them by hand and solder them here. And so the person working here will look through the book right. and see what has to be done. Exactly. Yeah. And just, but it'll be on a turntable so it's easy to move around. Yeah. But we do everything we typically build by sample and by photograph. So it's, it's like building a kit. It is. It's, yeah. it's very involved. And, it's, and it's, it's labor intensive and takes right. time. And, People, yes. until they see it, they don't appreciate it. No, they don't. No, that's oh, right. Should that. I take this? I certainly <laughs> can. Hello? <laughs> you know where I am? That's exactly right. Do you have industrial spies telling you that? <laughs> this is all being recorded. Is it okay to keep this in the video? I think it's... You know what, I'm, I'm thinking next year, next year uh, I'll consider that, but I have so much work to do and I'm so far behind and uh, I just don't, I just can't do it. Otherwise I would, but I can't do it. And I also, I also had to cancel Pacific Audio Fest. I just don't, don't have the time. I've got, I, I have a back, backup series of reviews that, I, that I'm behind on and it, it, it builds up agita in me. And so I need the time to get up to date and that's my first. That's my first goal. But as long as I was here at making vinyl, uh, and you know, vinyl is my my most important commodity. Yeah. So I came to this event also to support uh, Larry and Brian, who are doing a great. This was the best. This was the best making vinyl ever. And I was able to moderate two good panels, and it was very very good. And uh, and while I was here, I figured I would come out and, and and see audio research again in the new facility. So that's worked out great. Yeah, but she she's got the dogs, and she only wants to see dogs. But besides, I'm going. Actually, I'm flying Sunday to Iron Mountain in Pittsburgh, and I'm going to be touring uh, UMG's uh, storage facilities where they have all the tapes. And that. Yeah. But I've been to many hi-fi shows over the past couple of months between Munich and everything else. So uh, let me let me continue this tour, and it was great talking to you. And have a have a great show, and I hope it's good. And and you can tell them more, Reese, that I'll I'll become I'll come out next year. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, we're we're back. Fine. So back here, we got all of our transformers in and they are unfinished. We actually test them before they go into product. That's a good sure idea. That, that's a good idea to make sure they work properly and then we... Uh, where, are these, where are these sourced from? Uh, typically from different places, different companies in North Amer that are based in North America. Okay. So, and these are, I'd say every one of these is a custom design. We design 
Bill started designing transformers in-house and we think that's one of the keys that makes our products so different because we go for a very, very wide bandwidth. The materials, the layout, these are pretty complex. We can't, uh, there's nothing we could build in-house that's anything yeah. like this. So. Well, sometimes it's much better to have someone who specializes if in something can, to, to right? do it. Absolutely. Exactly. So we sand them down, then we paint them. Because people like to look on the insides and they right. really want to see something inside right. that looks uniform with what's on the outside. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So they're pretty hefty transformers. Yeah, I'm, I'm not for picking that one up. I'll amplifier. drop it. Right. All right, so now, now we're seeing the back of the back of the I-50 of the I-50 uh, build area. And this is also a part of those. This is the transformer right. module. Yes. Yep. Okay. And then we have. 6550s here for them. This is the uh, QC area where um, Darren, in this case, in this station, will uh, will test I-50s and uh, make sure everything passes. He'll do burn-in around here. We have a, uh, a board tester to look for flaws. It's a very neat looking product for sure. Thank you. And we ship worldwide, so obviously we have a lot of different power cords. Um, yep. An area that I want to take you through also is I'm going to take them through uh, the laser area. Yep. So Darren's building boxes for remotes right now. The we basically the, the new remote has the ability to with one with one keypad. Open my garage door, and we, I will if you'll give me. I, I don't even need the code. We can we can figure that out. Okay. So basically, with one board and one keypad, that we would remove buttons to associate with the correct overlay. Right, so, so so that knows that has that does every one of the things, and you just remove the. Mm -hmm. And you just tell it which remote it is. It actually has the program in it. You just oh. I, you just tell it what it is, and then you would be able to call it a GS Pre. We have everything here that we would build in a library of them that we would cut these. So we cut the overlay in-house. Right. And we engrave it on the laser as well with a fiber because it's a dual source laser, which we're about to see. So we Cerakote it, then we engrave it with the high definition right. on the bottom. We straight line sand to match the, in the same direction as a reference product. And then the board sits in here nice and snug um, and then magnets hold the overlay on okay and there's a battery in there too and the battery is already built in and it's sitting actually right underneath here okay I get it to pop and the off for consumer you. can get that out to change the battery mm -hmm. you just have to wiggle it out oh yeah and it's okay. just a CR, yeah 2032 cell yep. yep so and it just drops right back in there's two pins here that and actually there's four pins that locate that so it doesn't move around, and then the overlay. And so, you, you, do you have a trademark on high definition? Yes. And did you yes. sue the entire world of television? Well, we only have it for audio. Oh. So I see. Uh, it still keeps us busy suing companies that of course uh, they use high definition. And wait, let's it's such a great oh, it's such way? a great thing that you got that. Is that one of Bill's ideas? Oh yeah, Bill was the uh, the first one, and uh, and I'll give Bill a lot of credit. Was you know you have to defend it against everyone, and he sued Sony uh, back uh, in the eighties. And he won. Yeah, he won. They were doing, they were building a, or they were creating a high definition CD series, uh, and uh, he got him to back off. So Michael, I'll describe to you two things at once right now. So this is our laser engraver. It's a Epilogue Fusion Pro that's dual sources, so it's a CO2 and a fiber laser. And we're going to run the we're, our ghost meters. We're going to etch the oh, meter cool. engraving right now. It's going to focus itself, and it's going to start putting the actual scales on the meter, on the, the, the meter scales oh, cool. on the overlay.
And previous to this machine, you had uh, people running at high speed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which is not doable. Now, how, this machine looks fairly new. Yes. Yeah, we we, we got 21. Okay. Yeah. Is that when you introduced, did you introduce that look earlier? Didn't you? No, we did it before. We had the meters built entirely out of house. Oh. And uh, we, we started finding that we needed them. Uh, the cleanliness was an issue, so we started bringing the the units inside and then it was easier to do all of it because we were having scratches, blemishes. Of course, because people don't do it to the same degree of tolerance that you can do it before. Actually, we can open this lid because it's safe because we're running CO2 and you'll be able to actually see it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know people can see that at home. I think they can. Yeah, yeah. It takes longer than I would have thought. Eight minutes per per pound. It's, it's a very it's a, it's a high resolution. Yeah. It, it this took I would say six months to really perfect the program. Uh, the program mainly the uh, it needed the right amount of. of depth yeah, yeah. and then also to keep it from looking pixelated it needed to have the right type of dithering so it was a lot of trial and error to get and who programmed this i did you did mm -hmm. you were saying that that was such authority that i was pretty sure that it was you i i do all the i do all the graphic stuff on the laser uh -huh. and on the uv printer uh -huh. so i as well as doing uh cutting things for the well the program the, the remote we just looked at yeah. And uh, overlays, I program all that for them. And what's your what's your background? Are you an engineer? I'm an engineer, mechanical engineer. Um, I've been here for six years, um, doing that job. I took over for a friend Federico um, from from Santos Faber, who uh -huh. was uh, my predecessor. And so we, I, I, I do that, and now I'm doing director of operations. Um, I do that to help. I, I started out supporting Trent with that role, and, yeah. and it just worked out that I ended up being the best person to help everything get a transition. And are you an audiophile too, or are you just... I was not an audiophile when I started this. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> but I am. I'm learning to appreciate it. Good. And, and I do have my own set of audio uh, audio research gear now. I would hope so. And I. The, the wife acceptance factor is probably the hardest part of keeping that running in the house. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I, I went crazy. Stay strong. <laughs> We're going to move over here and I'll show you the, the printer, which isn't okay. on right now. But what we will do is show you things. The rear panel for the I-50s you just went by. Right. Right? We would print the rear panels. We print the... Uh, accessories, so the DAT card, the phono card, those, the, the blank one or the the, um, um, the single-ended accessory, all those get printed on here on a jig, so right. I can actually show you the jig. I don't know if I have any parts to get So all, all that we're seeing in here and all of this kind of stuff is really an update for the company, moving right. into, into, a, into a new, more modern era of... Right. And one of the things we also want to do is take as many processes in-house, under roof, and not have to rely on the yeah. external yeah. vendors outside the So this is the jig for the digital DAC, and the PIM nuts that are on it, the, what, what you would use to screw it to the chassis, act as locations. So then you just load it up with as many as you need, and you print it. And those are finished printed ones. That's, that's what that is. Well, no, this is actually the jig. Oh. And I just printed over it, and that way you, it's located correctly. Oh, I see. And you know which one it is. Okay. So it's convenient. So I, I did the, the hole cutting and these little engravings here on the laser next to it, right. and then printed it here. And that's why they look a little bit blurry, because I had to shift it to just make, it, make sure it's just perfect. I'm going to show this one's... So there's... Okay, those are the... A, a, a press-in threaded insert. Yep. And so what we do, that helps you to locate direction, obviously, up or down. Right. And then you would be able to nest it in there, and then they would fit exactly where they're supposed to. I see, and then, and then it would print... So you can print the whole bunch at one time, though? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so we, okay. print the, we can print the entire amount, and that would take about 30 minutes. It does multiple coats, so it does a... Uh, 
uh, an adhesion promoter to begin with, a primer, if you will. Right. Then the white, it does two, two coats of white, and then it does a clear over that to protect it. Yeah. So are, are we done? Basically. Yeah. Wow. We covered a lot of territory. Yes, we did. Michael, if you wanted to get another shot of these, they're almost done. You have more than one that you oh. can see. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. It helps a lot. It's funny because I think people look at that finished thing and they think, oh, they just stick blocks to it. There's a lot to the, um, the, even to point out these are the these are the windows for the LEDs. Yeah. So going from a mono that went to the end when we originally did it to a stereo, the LEDs can't be in the same places. Because the because with the mono, it needed to be right in the center, and when you did it with the stereo, then you had shadows out on the edges. Yeah. So I had I spent about four days straight oh. playing with where to I just read that one up. Like, where to put those exactly. I couldn't have done it straight, but I'm glad you did. And what are we seeing up there? What is it showing us? This, this, so, here. so these are cameras okay. on this unit. Really, it's really nice in that we're looking at what we're going to print. On. Oh, I see. So that's a, that's a real-time thing. Right. Yes. Oh. And I can actually, so I can take a file. I'm going to print something, which... Let's say I was, let's see here, let's say I wanted to print something, maybe just for you. So let's say I wanted to make you a, I don't know, something like a bottle opener, let's say. I can, right now, that's sitting right in, if you looked, and watch this, I'll just do it. I'll, sh I'll show you, and I'll use a red one so it's easy to see. Watch your hands. Okay, okay. I used this just as a, as a reference where I had overlaid this before, and it's engraved. Okay. So I marked that there. And it'll stay in place. It'll stay put. And then I would start printing that. Well, what are you going to print? I'm going to print audio research right on it, which I've got it upside down. So let's do it the other way, just for grins. Because I can. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to hit print. And now it's, it's shown up on my menu of choices to print. Right. And I'm going to hit start, and it's going to go over there, and it's going to start printing it. Now this one we can't look at because it's the fiber is actually dangerous for your eyes. That's why this is tinted yellow. Oh, I can, I can look at it. You can this look one. at it through here, through the there. yellow safe. You can't lift it up. And okay, that's fine. It. So this will, this will be something you wouldn't want to sit here for the whole time. It's going to do the same logo three times. Just to make it more... Mm -hmm. So we don't want to. We don't want to stay here. You want to stay here, but we'll, we'll. This is like the cooking show. Yeah. I'll we'll pull the one out that's the finished. It's already finished, right, ready right. for you. Okay, I like that. Yeah, oh, we already gave it to you. Yeah. No, I took it go. off the table. Oh, I, I assumed it was okay, you were yes, giving it to me. Yeah. I took a lot of things in my pocket. I'm not <laughs> telling you most of them. Patch it down before you leave. You better. I'm desperate. I'll take it. Whatever I can get. Well, we've seen everything. Yes, we have. Great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much, Dave. It's great to see you in your home headquarters. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, and you know I forgot your name. I'm ready to be able to Les. Name. Les Robinson. Les Robinson. Okay. I'm really bad with names. If I was good with names, I'd be a politician, but I'm not good with names. It's and good and you, you are? Evan Scutius. Okay. And okay. Evan is going to be oh, the next Warren. The next Warren. So right. Warren's, Warren's not here, so if I imitate <laughs> Warren, is it okay? Are right. you gonna, yeah. And are you going to end up talking like that, too, after not a few yet, months? Of, that comes with time. Yeah, it takes right. time to, to really get that groove in there, I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he does. He won't mind if I no, make. I make, fun, I'm a, I make fun of everybody except, my, except me. I cannot right. have anybody make fun of me. Well, if you keep talking like Warren, we'll start making fun of you. That's good. That's okay. our main pastime. Okay. okay.